So today, here at Daybreak Community Church, we start a new series, probably uh, a seven or eight part series, on the subject of by faith alone. Hebrews chapter 11 is a wonderful passage of scripture that helps us to look back in time and to see what happened many years ago with the believers from a p previous period of history. And uh, today I want to talk about Abel, the first person who's talked about, Abel, the man with a right heart. Now, I have tried to put some Polish in. So if it works, it's okay. But if it doesn't work, forgive me. Okay, I have tried throughout so that you will be able to look at the English and see what the English says and help you to understand what I'm saying. And there are four points I want to bring up here. Firstly, I want to introduce the passage and the, the theme of By Faith Alone. Then I want to talk about the story of Cain and Abel. How many have read the story of Cain and Abel? I don't mean the Jeffrey Archer book. <laughs> then I want to talk, thank you, about Abel's sacrifice and his faith. And then to talk about how faith is a matter of our heart. So our introduction first of all then. Now this chapter in chapter 11 and our, our walk, our journey over the next few months is about people who learned to live by faith. And this is a series of studies for anybody who wants to grow stronger in faith. Now if you are a person here who is not of faith and you don't believe in God, don't worry, because if you want to find out more, if you want to grow in your life, then this series of studies is for you. There are very few people in the world today who, if I came to them and I said, do you want to be happier? Do you want to be stronger? Do you want to know about your future? I don't think anyone is going to say to me, no, I don't. Are they? That is what we call a no-brainer. So... Being here today and listening is our opportunity to open our minds and to begin to understand the things that many people in the world today do not understand. So we can grow stronger in faith. And also we can learn to live by faith in the good times when things are going really well and we're happy, but also in the bad times when it seems that God is silent and we don't hear from God when we feel unhappy or miserable or sad. The great story from Hebrews chapter 11 is that people who lived before us centuries ago, many years ago, learned to live by faith and to walk by faith even when life was very difficult. In fact, their lives were much more difficult than ours could ever be. So we turn then to Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 to 3. And this is what the first couple of verses say. To have faith is to be sure of the things we hope for, to be certain of the things that we cannot see. It was by their faith that people in ancient times won God's approval. So when we ask ourselves the question, what is faith? There's the best example, the best definition of it. It's being sure of the things we hope for. Think about what you are sure of. Are you sure that it's 25 to 12 now? In 25 minutes' time, it will be 12 noon. You might be. Are you sure that today you will have Sunday lunch? Ellen, you're going to have Sunday lunch? Okay. But there are some things we can be sure of. And faith is that. Faith is about being sure of the things that we hope for, the things that are in our hearts. You know, sometimes people say, Chan, I don't have much faith. Hold on. Wait. Think about what you are hoping for. Hold that thought in your mind. Bring it into your heart. And then ask God to help you to be sure of it. To be certain. This ground is firm. I know because I built this building. 
and it, it will not collapse. It has steel running through it. It has concrete blocks. And it is firm. And even when the winds are going, it, will, it might move a little bit, but not much. Is that right, Brian? It is strong. Faith is like that. Faith is being sure of the things that we hope for and certain of what we cannot see. Certain. Certain in there and certain in there. We cannot see God yet. We will see him one day. But we can be certain that God is real, that God is alive because what, of what he has done in our lives, because our lives have been changed. I became a Christian when I was 14 and a half. I can remember it precisely because I know the day I became a Christian when I said to Jesus, I will follow you all my life. And so I have grown up thinking about living for loving God, reading the Bible. And so for me, there is no other life. This is the only life that can be lived. The Bible has molded my mind. It has changed the way I think. It has created the way I speak. It influences my thoughts and my decisions and my choices. I make mistakes because I am a sinner. I have uh, sin in my life. But the, but the Bible and the Holy Spirit enable me to live differently day after day. And I know God is with me all the time. I know it. And I know he will never leave me. I know he will always be there for me. I am certain of it. I am certain of what I cannot see. I am sure of what I hope for. And that's what faith is. And that is how the people in old times lived. They lived by faith and they won God's approval. So God blessed them because they did what they knew they should do because they were living for God. And that is what being a believer is all about. And here is where it starts. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what is visible. What that means is when God created the ground and the sea and the sky and the stars, he created it out of nothing. What we now call the Big Bang is probably us just catching up with what the Bible told us thousands of years ago. But it wasn't a Big Bang. It was God saying, God doesn't need a bang to start the universe. He's God, God of the universe. So he simply said, let there be light. And then light was there. God created the entire universe out of nothing. And it's faith that tells us that. How do I know it? I don't know it. But do I know it? Yes, I know it because God says he did it. And that's what faith is. Faith is not blind. Faith is not blind faith. Faith is seeing with your heart. The greatest songwriter, one of the greatest songwriters of all time was a lady called Fanny J. Crosby. Have you heard? She's, she wrote more than 8,000 songs. Songs like, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine, Safe in the Arms of Jesus, and thousands more. Fanny J. Crosby, at the age of six weeks old, was blinded. She had a, an illness, and the surgeons at that time, this was in America in the 1800s, they put a mustard poultice bandages on her eyes. That was common, and they think that caused her to go blind. She lived till the age of 95 years old, Fanny J. Crosby. She wrote 8,000 songs. She lived a life full of hope. She started an institution for the blind in America. During her time, from uh, around about 1860 to 1915, she was probably the best-known woman in the United States of America. Virtually every, every hymnal, hymn book in America has her songs. 
But she said, I thank God that I was blind. Because if I had not been blind, I would not have loved Jesus as much as I do today. Because I did not have the distractions of the things that I could have seen, I saw Jesus in my heart. And she wrote another wonderful song called, I shall know him, I shall know him, as redeemed by his side, I shall stand. It, it's a song which says, the first face I'm going to see, when I begin to see, is the face of Jesus. And it's the same faith that tells us that God who we cannot see formed everything. He created everything out of nothing. And so if this God is so powerful that he can create everything out of nothing, can he meet your need? He can. He can meet your need. He can meet you at the, the point of your deepest sorrow and distress. He cares for you. He loves you. He created the world so that you might be there. So that you might have joy. So that you might know what it's like to have a heavenly father who loves you. And so that you may experience that for your life. So that's where we start. That's where faith begins to start. George Muller was a wonderful Christian man who lived in this country in the 19th century. And he spent his whole life looking after children who were on the streets, orphaned children with no parents. And the, the buildings that he built then are still there today. Very often, he had no money. He would pray, and God would send the money in. And he said this. He said, faith begins where man's power ends. When we come to the end of our hoarded resources, our Father's full giving has only begun. His love knows no limit. His grace knows no measure. His power no boundary known unto man. For out of his endless riches in Jesus, he gives and gives and gives again. And that's what faith is about. It's about believing that when you feel tired in your life, when you feel you can't go on, when you feel you have no more love, when you feel exhausted emotionally, God can come and pour his love into your life so that you feel refreshed and energized. That's faith. And that's why Christian people are meant to be the happiest people on earth. We need to be going around most of the time with a big beaming smile. This business has now become a 20 smiles per hour zone. It was 15 smiles per hour. Now it's 20. You look around at the posters, you'll see. And, you know, 20 smiles per hour. Can you manage it? Thank you. <laughs> well done. Now, sometimes people talk about positive thinking. Positive thinking is not the same as biblical faith. Now, I am a positive person, all right? Would you agree with that? I am an optimist. My glass is half full, not half empty, all right? Half full. I've got all of that. I'm not looking at what I don't have. I am looking at what I do have. It's half full. But... Even though I want us all to think positively, something good is going to happen to me today, it's, that's not the same as biblical faith. Biblical faith is, something good is going to happen to me today in Jesus' name. That's biblical faith. Biblical faith is when we put God into our lives. When everything we do is based on trust in God. So we put our hands out to reach out to God and God grabs our hands. Positive thinking people will say, I can do this, I can do this, I can do this. Not bad, not bad to start with. But positive thinking people get to the point when I can't do it. Because every human being comes, starts at a certain point and stops. That's called death, all right? We can't go beyond death. So, and the same principle operates throughout our lives. We can say, I can do this, up to a certain point. We need the hand of God to hold us, and we need to hold God. So if you are a person who is relying on yourself, on your positive thinking, on your self-sufficiency, let go. Let go today and get hold of the hand of God. That's a much firmer hand to hold on to when things are 
going different. So that's going difficult. So that's what is the difference between positive thinking and faith. Faith, someone said, is not simply one way to please God. It is the only way. No matter what else we may think, say, or do in the name of God, whatever we do, it doesn't matter if you're a Sunday school teacher, if you're a preacher, if you're a missionary, it's faith. It's meaningless and worthless unless there's faith in it. And that's what Hebrews 11 tells us all about. It doesn't tell us only about good people. In fact, most of the time it talks about people who had, who had big problems in their lives. But the difference was that they had faith in their lives. So whoever we are today, however difficult our lives may be, however weak we think we are as Christians, if we have just a little bit of faith, that begins to please God. So that's our first point. That's our introduction. Now we go on to the story of Cain and Abel. So Hebrews chapter 11 verse 4 tells us this. And of course the story of Cain and Abel is in the book of Genesis chapter 4. This is what it says. It was faith that made Abel offer to God a better sacrifice than Cain's. Through his faith, he won God's approval for himself as a righteous man because God himself approved of his gifts. By means of his faith, Abel still speaks even though he is dead. So the writer to the Hebrews is saying this man, this man's life, which was brought short, and we'll talk about that in a minute, speaks to us today, even though he is dead. So the story of Cain and Abel, which many of you know, it's the story of how what is in our hearts can affect our lives. What goes on here affects our lives. You know the story of Cain and Abel? They were the first children of Adam and Eve. So you can just imagine that they were, they were two boys. We don't know how long they lived for. We don't know quite how long people lived at that time. But they were brought up by Adam and Eve, the first people who lived upon the face of the earth. One day, our scientists will understand through science why the Bible is true and how it is that the things that God speaks of in the Bible are absolutely true. Now, I don't know whether the six days that are in the Bible are actual six days, you know, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. I don't know if that's the case, but I know that God says he created a man and a woman. And that's how he started the human race. And that's what the Bible says. So by faith, until someone is able to prove that's wrong, I will choose to believe what the Bible says. So Adam and Eve brought up their children to know God. They knew that God was holy and God could only be Worshipped if you brought the sacrifice of a life, of an animal. The blood of an animal was the sacrifice on behalf of your sins, to take, to, to take away your sins. And we, we have the story of Cain and Abel bringing their sacrifices to God. So Cain is a farmer and he brings all the things that are growing in the ground. And... Uh, Abel is a, uh, a shepherd, and he brings a sheep, a lamb, and they're offered to God. And God accepts the sacrifice that Abel has given, but he rejects the sacrifice that Cain has given. And Cain, of course, is very angry about this, and he, his, his face falls, he scowls. He begins to threaten his brother, and eventually he murders him. First murder in human history. And we can only imagine what Adam and Eve's grief must have been like. They had no experience of death. They certainly had no experience of one of their children murdering another. So their lives as parents were filled with tragedy. They lost the world that God had given them. So they're, they're, they were filled with guilt and a sense of remorse uh, and loss 
and destitution, and then one of their children kills the other. First murder in human history. All because of this situation of sacrifice and what God said was acceptable and what he said was not. So we need to understand this by looking at Abel's sacrifice and his faith because the writer to the Hebrews says, you need to know about Abel because what Abel did pleased God. Now this is what it says. It was faith that made Abel offer to God a better sacrifice than Cain's. Through his faith, Abel won God's approval as a righteous man because God approved of his gifts, the things that he brought, the lamb. By means of his faith, Abel still speaks to us today, even though he's dead. So down through the centuries, Abel, this man, is speaking to us and saying, listen to me, listen to my life, listen to what I did, even though my life was cut short by my brother killing me, listen to what I have to say, because I have things to say to you. So we have to ask ourselves the question, why was Abel's sacrifice better than Cain's? It seems that God was not fair in this. But you see, these are the reasons. Abel was aware of God's position. He knew that he was separated from God by his sin. He knew that uh, he had a sense of loss in not having that relationship. He knew he wanted God in his life. Did, it, did Cain want God in his life? Who knows what Cain wanted? Cain wanted God's approval, but did he want a relationship with God? So many people want what God can give them. They want the peace. They want the prosperity. They want the, the relationships. They want the job. They want the peace on earth. They want the little children to not be on the streets. They want an end to cancer and killing and an end to the wars. But do they want God, who is the one who gives it? Maybe that was the problem with Cain, that he didn't really want God. Abel wanted God. He wanted the relationship with God. He wanted to be back in touch. And, you know, that's the great thing about being a Christian. If you find yourself having sinned and not being with God, you cannot sleep, you cannot rest until you are back in relationship with the Lord and where your heart is at peace with Him again. So Abel wanted to be restored. He wanted to be lived to be able to live according to God's original purpose. That was why his sacrifice was so special. And there's more. He also wanted to find peace in his heart. Only Jesus Christ can give us real peace. It amazes me that people in this world go everywhere. They will do drugs and alcohol and sex and money and work but they won't come to God to find real peace, the peace that makes your heart to be really at rest. And Abel wanted more. He wanted to make a better world. His parents, Adam and Eve, would have said to him, Abel, listen, and Cain, we, we made a big mistake. We could have had heaven on earth. We were in the Garden of Eden. We had everything. We never got tired. We enjoyed food. And we never got fat. And Abel must have thought, I'd like to build a world like that. I'd like to restore heaven on earth. I'd like to have the Garden of Eden again. So he was coming to God saying, God, I am a sinner. I have so much wrong in me. I try to do good, but I am still a sinner. I make mistakes. And he brought his sacrifice. He brought his lamb. It sounds cruel. But it was, it was what God said. It was either Abel's life or the lamb's life. And the lamb was an innocent animal. And the lamb would have its throat cut, its blood spilled out, and its body burned on an altar. It sounds terribly cruel, but that's what sin does in our lives. Sin takes us away from God. It destroys us. It does horrible things. And the only way God can put it all back together is if a life is given on our account, instead of us, another life. And you, we know the story. Instead of us, the man on the cross who would die for us so that we could have peace with God. That's the only way to make a better world. We cannot make a better world through peace treaties and arms treaties and, and wonderful works. That will make kind of a better world. 
But it's only when we come to God and we find peace with God through Jesus Christ on the cross that we'll find a better world. He was hoping that what he did would reflect a growing sense of love, of his appreciation, of his gratitude, and of his aspiration, meaning, God, I want to live for you. That's what worship is. I want to live for you all my life. I want everything I do to just be for you. Because if I am living for you, I know that everything I do will be for everyone else as well. I will make the difference in people's lives. If my heart is fixed on you, oh God, if my heart is absolutely fixed on you, then things will change in the world around me because you will work through me to change other people's lives. Abel came to God with that in his heart. That is why his sacrifice was so much better than uh, Cain's because he was saying, this sacrifice, Lord, represents all of that. Peace, worship, sins being forgiven. Which takes us really to the fourth and final point, which is that faith is a matter of our heart. It isn't about what we do, it's what goes on in our hearts. You see, our heart attitude is more important than our outward actions. Today, throughout this country and in other parts of the world, people will go to church buildings. They will read from hymn books or Bibles, but they will leave that building and go away unchanged. They will be the same. Their actions are right, but their hearts are not. So we have to ask ourselves the question, do our actions reflect what's in our hearts? Because if we are believers, then our actions also should follow the way we believe. We could also ask ourselves the question whether we are struggling with anything in our lives. We're struggling with letting something go and offering it to God. You see, these two boys had... One had the animals, and the other had what was growing out of the ground. And Abel had to bring what was precious to him. So he brought one of his living animals. Cain should have had the wisdom and the sense to do a trade with Abel. He needed to have something of cost, so he needed to buy one of Abel's animals in order to bring the animal. We don't know what a, uh, Cain brought. Perhaps he brought God some weeds. He brought the produce, but did he bring the best or did he bring the end of it? Did he bring the end of the crop? Who knows? We don't know. But the point is that Cain did not want to let go of what was important to him, whereas Abel did. And that's one of the lessons we need to learn in our lives. See, God knows what is in our heart. We cannot hide our true intentions and our heart attitude from God. So in Abel's life, as far as he was concerned, he was completely focused on God and wanting to give God everything. Cain's life was tight and gnarled and uh, unwilling to yield to God. And God showed. He shows how he, he views our offerings. He accepted Abel's offering, the fire came down and he accepted it. And in the case of Cain, he did not accept it. So you see, we might be doing the right things, but we may have the wrong motives. One of the most important things that we would say to you in coming to Daybreak Community Church is this. Please come. Do come. Enjoy the services. Enjoy the worship. However, please strive to ensure that your heart is changed that you are a true follower of Jesus Christ. That that will make the difference. It will help you to, to make sense of it um, so that what I'm saying works for you in your own life. We can ask ourselves, what's the hardest thing for us to bring to God as an offering or a sacrifice? What's the hardest thing? When you think about it, you'll find that probably the hardest thing is your own will your own will, your willingness to say, I will come to you, Lord, and I will give you my will. In other words, you will no longer say, I am in charge of my life. You will say, God is in charge of my life. I challenge you, that is, the, that is probably the thing that ultimately we have the greatest difficulty letting go of. But once we do it, as Abel did, 
Abel's life was then free. And even though his life was cut short, the years that he did live were full of hope, full of faith, so much so that thousands of years later, we are still talking about Abel because of his sacrifice. But you see, we've talked about Abel, but the story wouldn't be complete without looking at the heart of Cain because there's such a contrast in the character of these two brothers. Genesis chapter 4, verses 6 to 10 says this. We know that Abel brought his sacrifice. Cain brought his sacrifice. God accepted Abel's sacrifice. He rejected Cain's. And Cain scowled. His, his face fell. His countenance fell. And the Lord said to Cain, Why are you hungry? angry? Why that scowl on your face? If you had done the right thing, you would be smiling. But because you have done evil, sin is crouching at your door. It wants to rule you, but you must overcome it. Now, this is a very, very important lesson from the story about by faith alone. Cain's reaction showed his um, heart to God. The way he responded to what God was saying and the way God related to his offer. It showed what was going on in his heart. Now, <clears throat> I can't see your hearts, but God can see yours and he can see mine. And this is what the, the Apostle John says in 1 John 3, verses 11 to 12. The message you heard from the very beginning is this. We must love one another. We must not be like Cain. He belonged to the evil one and murdered his own brother Abel. Why did Cain murder him? Because the things he himself did were wrong and the things his brother did were right. That is one reason why Christians are persecuted. That is why, even in England, people hate what we do and stand for, because the things that we present are from God. They are the truth. It is God saying, this is how you must live. Therefore, if you want to be a Christian, join the, the, the army of people who are hated. That's the way. People will say, Chan, don't you want people to come to church? Yes, I do, but I'm being honest with you. If you only, only become a Christian and follow the Lord if you're prepared to stand up for what you believe. And that is why being a Christian, a follower of Jesus, is the bravest thing you can do. The really courageous people are those who follow Jesus Christ because there are those who are against you. And Cain refused to go that way. So... Think about this. God said, be careful because sin is crouching at the door of your heart. Even now, depending on how you respond to this word that I'm bringing, sin could be crouching at the door of your heart, ready to come in if you do not fill your life with Jesus Christ. Think about the warning signs that your heart's attitude is wrong to God. Here's one warning sign. If as I'm speaking... There's a bit of you which is saying, Ooh, I do, uh, uh, uh. do you understand? There's a bit of you, or something like that. And there's a bit of you that, it, part of you is saying, no, no way, no way, Jesus. You cannot come into my life. You can come this far, but no further. That's a warning sign. That is a big triangle warning sign. Because if you don't let Jesus into your life, sin is crouching at the door, ready to jump into your life. I'm not trying to frighten you. That's the way the devil works. If we do not fill our lives with God and his word, our lives have got to be filled with something else. And you know, if Jesus Christ is in our lives, it affects our, the way we look. That's why I encourage people to smile. I encourage people who are not Christians to smile because they're alive. Because the alternative is not very good, is it? It's great to be alive. So smile. 20 smiles per hour zone. But if you're a Christian, you have even more reason to smile. We want to build a church of smilers. They're going to hate us for the smiles that we have. Wherever we go, smiling. And uh, there'll be times when we don't feel like smiling, I know. It doesn't matter. In those times, we pray for each other. And you reach out to the Lord. He'll help you. He will put the smile back inside your heart. And God was saying, if you don't master sin, it will master you. 
So think about it, Christian particularly, but as well non-Christian. Is there an area of vulnerability in your life where sin is crouching at the door, waiting to attack you? If so, how are you handling it? This is very, very important because we can fall into temptation and we can sin and we can lose control of our lives whereas, or mastery, whereas God wants to be controlling and leading our lives. Have you seen sin take you by surprise? Have you been in a situation where suddenly something's happened? Here is an easy example, anger, all right? Now, no one here gets angry, I know that, so I'm talking about other pe people outside. But anger, you know, uh, if it takes you by surprise, if you, if you know the situation, think about it. Be prepared. And there are many, many other situations. Don't put yourself in a place where sin can take mastery of your life. And we're coming towards a close here. Cain sadly thought God was unfair to him by rejecting his sacrifice. So he murdered Abel, even though Abel lived a life that was pleasing to God. So we could say, that seems unfair. Your God is unfair, a non-Christian might say to me. The reality is, life is not always fair. Okay, let's get over it. Let's just call a spade a spade and not an agricultural instrument. Life is not fair. That is because of sin. Our sin has made life not fair. It's not God. It's not that God is not fair. It's life is not fair. God is always fair. And for us who worship God, we need to have as our goal that we want to please Him and not allow these other things to ruin our lives. Even if terrible things have happened to you, I want to invite you today to bring them to Jesus, to let Him heal you of the pain and the sorrow and the years you feel you've lost so that they don't ruin your life. This is the way we can live. Abel lived like that. He lived a life that was pleasing to God. Cain lived his life screwed up, and he himself became a cursed man, and his descendants brought all sorts of troubles on the earth. So we come now to our final scripture. And here, the writer to the Hebrews in the, in the 12th chapter picks up the story, and he talks in this way. He says, you've come to Jesus who arranged the new covenant and to the sprinkled blood. That's the blood of Jesus that promises much better things than does the blood of Abel. You see, the blood of Abel called out for vengeance. When Cain murdered Abel, God came to Cain. He said, where is your brother? And Cain said to him, how do I know? Am I my brother's keeper? And God said to him, the blood of your brother speaks to me, cries out from the earth. It cries out for vengeance. And let me say this in passing. All the blood that has been spilt on this earth, all the murders, all those children who were taken away from life before they left their mother's womb, judgment will one day come on every person who was responsible for taking someone else's life unless they have already submitted and surrendered themselves and come to God for forgiveness. God will judge. Be certain of that. We may today in this world say, it isn't fair. Look at all these horrible things happening. One day a great throne will be set in the heavens, a great white throne, and God will call every single person to account. And the, the trials we see now for genocide will be nothing like what God will do on that final day when the court of heaven the judge of the universe will put everything right. But he started the process because the blood of Abel was saying, was calling out for judgment, but the blood of Jesus, which was poured out when he was crucified, now speaks of forgiveness and of peace. And Abel's sacrifice was accepted, and the sacrifice that Jesus brought was also accepted. Abel was a man with a right heart. And that is the, the first paving stone on our road to being to walking with God with faith by faith alone to have our hearts right to just believe what God has said and as we do that we'll find that just like Abel whatever happens in our lives we will live lives with a pure heart and we will find that our faith day by day 
is getting stronger. May the Lord bless us. May we continue to grow strong in faith and walk with him by faith 